Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for um, joining us for our ACRL session called um, Open Access Investment at the Local Level, Sharing Diverse Tactics to Improve Accessibility to improve access and affordability. My name is Sam Toplitsky. I'm the Open Science Librarian at UC Berkeley, and we have a set of panelists who will introduce themselves momentarily. Um, these slides will be available um, to be shared after the presentation, and of course, the video as well is available to you. Uh, next slide. So our objectives um, for you all for this session um, are to, we hope to describe the key open access investment considerations and processes from the perspective of an academic library, a nonprofit, and an open project. Um, understand priorities, workflows, and collaboration opportunities in these sorts of situations. And we hope that you all will take home strategies and best practices for approaching open access investment conversations at your own institutions. We'll start off with some brief introduction so you can get to know the panelists. As I said, I'm the Open Science Librarian at UC Berkeley. Hey everyone, I'm Tim Ballmer. I'm the Scholarly Communication and Copyright Librarian at UC Berkeley Library. And with Sam, we were on the Open Access Investment Working Group, which I'm going to be talking about today. Hello, everyone. I am Charlotte Lair, Senior Strategist of Open Access and Scholarly Communication in Initiatives at Lyricist, and I will be talking about the Open Access Community Investment Program. Hello, everyone. I'm Tom Narok. I'm an Assistant Professor of Data Science at Goucher College in Baltimore. Uh, I work primarily in applications of earth and environmental science, and in that role, I'm one of the co-founders of a preprint service called Earth Archive, and I'll be talking about open access and in, in preprint publishing. And I'm Justin Gonder. I'm the senior product manager for publishing at California Digital Library, which serves the University of California system and worked with uh, Tom to on the migration of Earth Archive. I also work um, on East Scholarship, which is the open access publishing and institutional repository for UC. Um, thanks, everyone. We'll first go to Tim to give an introduction of the um, Open Access Investment Working Group at Berkeley, and then we'll continue on to Sharla and then Tom and Justin. And after that, we're all going to engage in a bit of discussion and um, have uh, um, some prompts and questions that we'll address. Cool. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the OA Investment Working Group that ran over the course of a few months uh, last year at UC Berkeley. Um, the working group was comprised of members of our Collection Services Council, um, and that council provides um, supports and guidance on um, the sort of broad stewardship of the Berkeley Library collection. Um, the reason for the working group stems from the fact that, you know, advancing open access to scholarship is one of the library's key strategic priorities. Um, now, to give you a bit of context, um, UC Berkeley is a part of the larger University of California system. So our library already partakes in many open access projects and programs, um, including things like the UC's open access policy, uh, transformative open access agreements, and some shared collection development um, across the UC. Um, now the University of California also has a system-wide group that evaluates and makes recommendations on investment opportunities, um, particularly things like scholarly communication initiatives that would be impactful to all of the UC schools. Um, that thing is called the STAR team, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but UC Berkeley is a big school um, and a big library. We have over 40 subject area, subject area liaison librarians with selector responsibilities. And we didn't really have a good process um, to evaluate open access opportunities at the local level. So um, the Open Access Investment Working Group was established to really develop local best practices and processes to guide the library investment in OA products and services. And the working group included members from uh, not just our Collection Services Council, but also liaison librarians from our other division councils. So, um, divisions like physical and life sciences, um, the arts and humanities, and also, also uh, social sciences. 
So first I'll talk a bit about our process in actually developing the criteria. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the proposed criteria themselves. Um, and then I'll briefly describe sort of draft workflow uh, and system that we've suggested for actually reviewing a proposed resource um, that's being considered for local investment. So first off, we wanted to get a lay of the land with regard to our local selector librarians and whether they were already using some of their funds to purchase open access materials. So we created a survey to really get at the baseline for um, selector engagement in OA investment at Berkeley. So we asked questions like, you know, what open access initiatives do you currently support using your selector funds? Um, and how and why did you decide to dedicate funds to those types of initiatives? Now, the bottom line is that we found that most Berkeley Library selectors aren't really supporting many open access resources with their funds. Although there was some activity such as supporting things like archive or there was some departmental support for various open access projects. Um, and we, know, we heard that some selectors had been approached by vendors or publishers to um, ask them to contribute to open projects such as things like the Digital Library of the Middle East, uh, unpaywall journals and Authoria. Um, the next thing we did is we conducted some background research about open access investment criteria at the local level at other universities. And we really didn't find much going on or at least none that could address open access opportunities um, by librarians at the local level. Uh, one thing on our research that was really helpful was a 2019 report from Rebecca Kenenson and others um, it was called um, OA in the Open Community Needs and Perspectives. And that work really focuses on identifying challenges for collective funding of open access. And we thought that was really useful as we developed our local criteria. Um, we also reviewed the work of uh, the UC system-wide team that evaluates these investments. Um, I mentioned that's called the STAR team. And this group has a very extensive set of criteria um, actually going more in depth than ours uh, eventually ended up being. Um, so it was really useful to be able to adopt some of their criteria within our own local recommendations. And then the third thing our group did was we began to sort of winnow the criteria from a big set um, and also did some sort of thematic grouping of the criteria that we found. So we we made sort of three groupings that made sense to us. Um, impact, sustainability and governance, and sort of UC Berkeley focused. So um, a few around impact, uh, we developed criteria like, for example, can a resource demonstrate a disciplinary, disciplinary, disciplinary impact? Um, can it show faculty impact or student success? Um, does it provide access to unique content that is not available somewhere else? Um, from a sustainability perspective, would an investment by us help sustain a crucial open access project? Um, is the potential resource mission driven to serve scholarly researchers? Does the resource demonstrate a commitment to advancing social justice and diversity goals? Is the resource not for profit? Uh, can it demonstrate operational and financial stability, or it has a clear plan to be able to do so in the future? Um, does the resource provide transparency into its finances and how it's actually being run? Um, is the resource available under open licenses, such as Creative Commons licenses for content or open source software licenses? And the final one for the sustainability and governance is does the resource meet standardized technical standards um, for formats and accessibility? And the final uh, prong was um, sort of local focus. So does the potential investment support Berkeley's institutional mission and our library strategic priorities? Um, is it endorsed or led by academic community members, especially scholars from Berkeley? Um, does it support or promote Berkeley's reputation or the visibility of Berkeley scholars? Um, does it reduce access or financial barriers um, directly for our audiences? So faculty, students, staff. And then finally, can the resource be integrated easily within our existing infrastructure at, at the library? 
So the next thing we looked at is um, when the criteria are adopted, how do you actually implement them so it's easy for librarians to use? So we worked on coming up with a process for reviewing a proposed open access resource for investment. And we suggested a dual track workflow, one for smaller investments and one for more significant investments. And this is because at Berkeley, our selectors have a lot of freedom to make smaller investment decisions themselves, but they require approval for some of the larger uh, dollar amounts. So I'm not gonna go through the workflow charts in detail. You know, they're specific to UC Berkeley, but I'm sure a lot of other um, research libraries have similar sort of, sort of like frameworks. Um, and we wanted to make it as easy and streamlined as possible for our selectors to make these decisions for the smaller investments and really not hold them up with a lot of bureaucratic red tape. Um, but at the same time, for the higher investment workflows, um, we wanted to ensure that um, the UC Berkeley collection development funds are being used responsibly and also be able to highlight potential joint funding opportunities. So say if another UC school would be interested in a similar open access product or service or resource, we wanted to be able to share that information so we could possibly do some joint uh, funding of it together instead of Berkeley doing it and then all the, all the other UC schools sort of doing it separately. So we wanted to be able to collaborate in that way. So on the previous slide, I listed what the open access investment actually were, but we knew that simply having a long list is not really valuable to people if they don't know how to determine whether a proposed resource actually meets the individual criterion. So we also made an evaluation table and we just put it in a simple Google spreadsheet for now. So uh, the table lists each individual criterion and then also lists indicators next to it. And the indicators are what the reviewer can use to actually ascertain whether the resource under review meets it or not. So just a few examples, you know, for the criterion of can the resource provide indicators of faculty impact or student success, the indicators might include, you know, whether the resource or publication provides functionality or metrics that allows users to see usage and impact. And for the criterion that asks, does the resource commit to open access to content, data, and software under open licenses, the indicator for determining this is, you know, whether there's clear information on the website outlining the terms and open licensing options available, including things like Creative Commons licenses for text or the CC0 public domain dedication for data. So we're in the early stages of this, um, especially with COVID throwing a wrench into our typical library work, uh, not to mention some of the budget cuts that have already been locked in or seem to be looming on the horizon for a lot of libraries. Um, and of course, we wanna be able to make smart decisions to support open access creators and publishers to ensure improved access to research and data. Um, one outcome that we'd like to see from this project is to further improve some of the lines of communication that librarians and collection development people have with vendors, publishers, and OA uh, infrastructure and resource providers. Um, and we really wanna be as clear and transparent as we can about our values at the library, which we hope will shine through in some of the criteria. Um, another thing that would be helpful is to use these open access investment criteria to help educate our librarians and faculty about the costs and sort of access considerations with particular types of content and to look for ways that investing in open access can help address some of these concerns and fulfill our library and sort of university mission. And we know it's gonna take time, training and a lot of iteration. Um, and we don't expect everyone in the library to become an open access collection development expert overnight. So that's just a bit about our local criteria and the processes at the UC Berkeley Library. Um, and I'll turn it over to uh, the next presenter. So this is great to be able to talk um, right after uh, your presentation um, because it's kind of in response to what all of you are doing. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so in the emerging open access uh, publishing space, the library community, along with any other research or academic unit considering how to support open access, 
They're all confronted with opportunities to invest in thousands of open access publications, but libraries do not always have sufficient information about those publications or projects to vet them and make an informed investment decision relative and relevant to their institutional values. In addition to lacking detailed evaluative information, libraries are also faced with the administrative hurdles of having to deal with hundreds of different individual procurement processes. This problem is not unique to open access publishing. However, in the context of OA publishing, having to set up and maintain individual procurement processes for every single publication transitioning to open access is not sustainable. So I'm gonna cite the same report. Uh, the recent IMLS funded report OA in the open noted that the open content landscape is massive and unwieldy. Librarians at large universities, even those with dedicated scholarly communication librarians, were as likely to cite being overwhelmed and underinformed as were those from smaller staffed institutions. We need a stronger, more effective connection infrastructure to sustainably transition to open access. Next slide. So in response to this need, Lyricis and the group Transitioning Society Publications to OA or TSPOA of which I'm also a member, in collaboration with a cadre of librarians and mission aligned publishers are developing a community driven single entry point that allows multiple stakeholders to vet and fund scalable open access content initiatives. We are calling it the Open Access Community Investment Program or OACIP. It is designed to equitably connect multiple stakeholders in the scholarly publishing landscape to facilitate an experimental and incubation space for emerging open access funding and business models, to centralize the administration and funding of open access initiatives or programs at multiple scales, and make transparent to the community at large who is participating in each investment community, to provide a funding hub for more bespoke programs, output from smaller publishers, including scholar-led and library publishers, as well as niche scholarly output, all in order to grow and sustain diversity of scholarship. To enable investors to strategically fund individual programs or distribute funds to multiple programs all in one place, increasing efficiencies and convenience. And finally, and most importantly, I think, to help investors put their money where their mission is by facilitating mission matching between the investor and the program. Next slide. This concept came about in 2020 when Lyricis and TSPOA began holding consultations with scholarly societies and other nonprofit publishers to explore the possibility of a pilot to address these problems. As our discussions evolved, a vision for this community driven model emerged. Our primary aim was to develop a way to help match libraries and other prospective funders with nonprofit publishers and journal editorial boards that are seeking financial investments to sustain or transition to open access publishing of journals or books. But we also needed a way to provide these potential funders with useful information about the publications and publishers to make informed funding choices. Collectively, we developed criteria that publishers have an opportunity to respond to. Our pilot seeks to find the right questions to ask of publishers and then provide those answers to potential investors so that they can evaluate the propriety of investment relative to how and whether the responses satisfy their investment values and principles. Finally, we needed a way to connect the community of potential investors to what we were creating. So we needed an infrastructure to aggregate the investment opportunities along with outreach to promote it. Consortia, like Lyricis, are well positioned to support collective action, providing infrastructure for community building, as well as managing financial transactions between libraries and content providers. In that vein, OACIP infrastructure is set up very similarly to any other product, service, or program that you may find administered by your consortium. There is a web page with curated information supported by an experienced team to help with questions and facilitate payment. We launched the pilot of OACIP in December 2020, and it will run until the end of J June 2021. We selected two journals to participate through our two partners, Duke University Press and eScholarship, built an ad hoc webpage on the Lyricist website, and are using only the resources necessary to administer it efficiently with the idea that so long as we maintain a healthy ratio of resources put in to the number of participating programs, that we can grow the program sustainably as more resources become available. How's the pilot going? As of March 16, 2021, when we recorded this video, $3,000 per year for the next five years has been pledged for each of the journals
journals participating in the pilot. We do have several pending contributions for both journals as well, including from the UC system. You can see who has pledged and how much has been raised for each journal through the OHCIP webpage. On the other side of the coin, we have also received several requests from OA programs for both books and journals to join a waiting list if we do a second round of fundraising. Next slide. We are by no means the only ones doing a project like this. We have been inspired by SCOS, Invest in Open Infrastructure, the COPEM project, Knowledge Unlatched, and there are other similar programs in development. This simultaneous invention merely reveals the kind of infrastructure that our global community really needs to sustain open scholarship. We do not wish to compete with these programs, but grow along with them. We are only part of the universe. If this pilot proves the concept and the program is formalized, it has the potential to result in a web-based service to support information transfer, promote a diverse array of open access programs, managing secure transactions, and even providing return on investment reports to users. Investors will be able to contribute to single, multiple, or all publications on the site. It will also be interoperable so that other consortia or groups around the world can manage an instance at their local level, but connect to a global community investment portal for programs that exceed political boundaries in scale. By design, it will engage all stakeholders in the research and scholarly communication ecosystem to initiate and sustainably maintain the participating OA programs utilizing the workflows that already exist to support required procurement procedures. This is what we envision for the future of OACIP. Thanks. Well, so I'd like to provide a little bit of context and background about uh, Earth Archive and the services that we are uh, currently providing. Uh, and so in, in my role as a data scientist, I work primarily on the computational side of Earth Sciences. And so in that role, I have been very familiar with um, the original preprint service archive. Uh, and in discussions with Earth Science colleagues had always wondered, why do we not have this in, in Earth Sciences? It had become such a part of our, our workflow to to see research as soon as it was, it was available, to be able to cite it and have access to it. Uh, and so a few years back, we, a group of us in the Earth Scientists had kind of started building up momentum towards, could we have something like this um, within the Earth Science community? And in October of 2017, we had built up enough of a, um, not only a national, but we had fortunately discovered there was international interest in this as well. And so we had built up enough momentum that we launched uh, Earth Archive, uh, initially with the Center for Open Science. We are currently a little over uh, 2,000 contributions. That's as of, of March of this year. So uh, we're steadily growing, but just kind of give you a little context there, we're not currently on the uh, scale of archive or something like a, a bio archive. Uh, and we experience about uh, 1,600 downloads uh, per month. So uh, next slide, please. And we cover a wide range of subdomains within the Earth Scientist. And we were also uh, recognized that our friends in planetary science study these same topics just on a, a different planet. Uh, and so we also accept uh, very similar uh, topics for the, the planetary sciences as well. Uh, next slide. So one of the big driving um, missions of Earth Archive is community. And so we had wanted this from the very beginning to be uh, community driven where anyone could be involved. Um, we wanted to be independent of professional societies and journals, um, which is not to say that they don't have a role. We are all very much engaged in professional societies and journals, uh, but we wanted a publication open access platform which the earth science community could um, take ownership of. And so we have a volunteer advisory council. We have a group of 12 members who rotate uh, on and off on uh, two year shifts. Uh, and so every two years we open it up to a uh, open call for new advisory members. Um, we have a very extensive um, kind of review process that we go through to ensure that we are having um, diversity, both you know, geographically, um, in education and work levels, uh, gender. So we try to meet a broad 
um, diverse advisory council. Uh, and then we also have are very thankful for a group of international volunteers who have um, come on board as moderators who are help, helping us review the submissions each month. Uh, next slide. Uh, so what do we accept? So Earth Archive is both a preprint and postprint system. Um, so we accept uh, research articles that have not yet gone out for peer review, uh, but we also do serve as an institutional repository of sorts in that um, for peer reviewed publications where the journal allows it, we will accept the author's version of the manuscript. Um, and so we can provide a an institutional repository for those that, that do not have that at their, that capability at their current institution. And so we, we are want to be very, um, you know, not just open and open access, but open in the types of materials that we want to publish and get out to our community. So in addition to research articles, we, are, we welcome case studies, review articles, um, what are often called null results. So if you have it, an experiment that did not work and why it did not work would be very useful to the community. We will uh, happily publish that as well. And we, we do take software and uh, data sets as well. Okay. Uh, next slide. Okay. So we do, we do have this, um, very, we are very fortunate to have a group of uh, moderators who devote, uh, volunteer their time to help us review. Uh, we do not do any kind of peer review. We do not judge papers for scientific uh, merit or scientific uh, evaluate the scientific inclusions in any way. Um, what we do is simply we have a list of metadata that's required. Uh, our, our review team helps ensure that the papers are within the scope of Earth Archive and that all uh, needed material is provided. And then help us ensure that in the case of postprints, is this something that the journal is actually okay with us uh, publishing? Um, and we do take fraud and plagiarism very seriously. Um, we do not have any automated tools um, currently that detect this sort of thing, but if it is brought to the attention of the advisory board that um, you know, this has occurred, uh, we do reserve the right to, to take down papers after publication. Uh, next slide. And so, so this figure is kind of showing our first year um, and what was interesting is that what, as we kind of got up and running, the air scientists community was still coming to grips with preprints and you know, publishing a paper before submitting it to journal and you know, what that was all about. Uh, and so we did a, a study where we looked at all of our submissions and said, uh, what are we, are we getting actual preprints, papers that haven't yet been sent off for peer review, or are we getting postprints? Are these things that have been published elsewhere, and people just want another venue for making them publicly available. Um, and as you can see, the orange bars are representing the, the postprint. So in the first few months, we were essentially an institutional repository and posting uh, mostly uh, postprints. But I think as the word got out and people started becoming more familiar with uh, what a preprint was and what it could do for a researcher and the benefits of it, uh, the number of preprints slowly started to increase. And so by the end of our uh, first year, we were predominantly receiving preprints. Um, and it has been that, that way since uh, ever since. And so in the, the first um, few months, we were, we were getting about 40 submissions uh, and we're currently up to about um, 70 or so submissions per month. Uh, next slide. We we're also uh, at about 71% uh, distinct author rate. So we looked at all of the authors on all of the submission and said, are we getting the same group of folks who are just coming back and reusing Earth Archive or are we actually having new authors come in and, and um, contribute submissions? Uh, and so we're currently at 71%. Of course, the next question was, well, is that good? If we didn't have anything to compare it to, so we started looking around and we went and talked to our friends at the uh, Center for Open Science. Uh, they host about 25-ish preprints for a number of different uh, disciplines. Uh, and so we looked at their holdings and found that the average was um, you know, around 60 to 65%. And so we found, okay, we feel like we're, we're doing pretty well in terms of bringing in um, new authors uh, and new users each month. 
Um, next slide. And much like um, most communities, um, we still have a kind of a, a you know, preprint message to get out there. Um, as you can see here, there are some sub-disciplines within earth science who are all in on preprints and are our main contributors. Um, but we also have this very long tail effect where many of the sub-disciplines within earth sciences are still not sure about preprints, not sure about the benefits, um, not really sure what to make of all of this. And so there are uh, a number of sub-disciplines where we're currently focusing our attention to see um, how can we bring these capabilities to them? How can we better explain open access and, and the roles of, of Earth Archive and um, hopefully bring this up? And this is one of the areas where we uh, have unfortunately been impacted by the, the pandemic. As you can see, this was last updated in uh, 2019. Um, so really we have not had much of a capability of reaching out to these communities and reassessing um, if at any progress we were able to make in, in 2020. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so being a very community driven uh, organization, we are, have a very active social media profile. And so one of the things that we take great pride in is um, Facebook messages and tweets. As soon as paper comes in and is accepted for publication, we want to help broadcast that out to the earth science community. So we will often send out um, Twitter announcements, Facebook messages about new publications. Uh, and what we've found is that this has helped lead to broader discussion about uh, new research in, in the earth sciences. And one of the big um, benefits that we hear from our scientists is that being part of open access and being part of preprinting uh, has led to a significant increase in feedback on their work, um, more than that they had gotten by just traditional methods like you know, presenting at conferences or you know, talking in the hallways to colleagues. Um, and they found that open access has really led to uh, improvements in their work. They've gotten suggestions. Um, in some cases, new collaborators and new studies uh, have formed by the feedback and discussions that have um, begun as a result of them first submitting a preprint to, to Earth Archive. Uh, next slide, please. And so in October of last year, uh, we realized that we were not gonna be able to um, continue with the Center for Open Science. And so we made a decision to transition to California Digital Library. Um, and so what the, the main impetus for that, or for choosing CDL was that, I think, and Justin, well, I will elaborate on this. It, CDL's vision for open access and the ability of us to have open and governance uh, really aligned with our mission at Earth Archive. Um, they were providing a, a expertise in open access capabilities and leaving the, the governance to the earth science community. And it was really a perfect uh, mashing of, of everything that we were looking for. And so I'd like to turn it over to Justin so he can speak a little bit about that transition. And I'll keep it brief because I want to leave some time for discussion. But you know, it was sort of the stars aligned um, in that we there's a partner not represented on this call, um, which is Birkbeck University London, the developers of the Janeway platform, um, who also had sort of a capability to, to provide a preprint platform, but it wasn't quite at a minimum viable product level. And we spoke with them about, hey, we, you know, we have interest in supporting Earth Archive's mission here at CDL. And we are using the Janeway software in other areas of our work and supporting journals in particular. And so we were able to pretty quickly um, spin that up and uh, work on transitioning all the content um, over to our instance of Janeway, which is where Earth Archive's home is now. And, you know, just a time frame that took us, I think we started talking this time last year about and uh, launched the new Earth Archive site based on Janeway in October of 2020. 
And it really just fits with CDL's model of providing um, service and guidance to support open access projects uh, and then relying on the expertise of um, the researchers, um, such as the Earth Archive community to curate the, and build the content. We work at a sim very similar model with the journal that um, Sharla was describing, where we'll be providing the infrastructure for combinatorial theory, um, and we'll provide them guidance on best practices, um, but we don't specifically invest monetarily, um, and that's why you know it's been such a good match to work on that project too. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that, and we can move on to discussion. Um, thank you all, and thank you for sharing the details of your projects. I think to some it may seem that these um, really con uh, contrast and don't have that much in common, but I actually see a, a lot of overlap, and I'm hoping we can kind of get to that. I'll first say that, um, as Charlotte mentioned, we're speaking on March 6th, the morning of March 16th, which was um, coincidentally um, this morning the UC Elsevier deal was announced. Um, which I, I, I won't get into, people can read about that offline and there'll, there'll be a lot of commentary between now and, and when this session goes live, but I am struck by the difference in scale. And, and I think one of the things I wanna focus on in our discussion is just the idea of these themes that came out as you all were talking about, um, the importance of community, um, collaboration, sort of different scales um, in the way people interact and the, um, the stakeholders that are involved in these projects. So. Hopefully we can keep some of the criteria people mentioned, especially um, what Tim mentioned in, in, in the, the Berkeley criteria in the background as we um, start our discussion. Um, I first want to talk about um, the contrast you all see between um, the many paths to openness. Um, in some cases, this might be flipping or transitioning um, an older product or tool versus starting something new. So in the case of Earth Archive, you, you all were kind of starting from scratch um, versus trying to, you know, shoehorn something that might have existed already. Um, and the same in um, the OACIP, you're doing something kind of similar where you're um, um, kind of help, helping, helping things along and providing that, that kind of connection for projects. So do you all see... Um, and you know, what's the appropriate balance between helping something new and open versus kind of shepherding these older things along and helping them make that transition to an open model? Uh, I'll speak Whoever to that. To take um, it, yeah. the, in a lot of ways, for, especially from my own standpoint, as serving the library community as a consortium, it's, in, a, in a lot of ways, it's what the library community is needing. Um, mm -hmm to meet their own mission and who they're trying to serve. Um, there is some content out there that um, is still extremely valuable in spite of it being considered old. Uh, books right. fall into this in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. Monographs, the backlist, a lot of times get more use than front lists. Um, this, this has been proven over and over again. And so the idea of flipping a backlist of monographs may take precedence over a front list. The problem is, is the legacy of the how revenue it gets put into the system to support these programs in the first place when they were paywalled and how to transition that over to an open access framework has proven challenging. We're often finding that publishers are getting grant funds to support back, you know, backlist flipping because it takes a, a larger amount of money. There's a lot of work involved in getting the copyrights change, talking to all the authors, if they're an aggregator trying to get talk to all the publishers that are their partners and all of that. Um, whereas if they if it's a front list, if they own the content, it's a matter of just being brave enough to step in and create some kind of model and then being able to interact with the library community or whoever else they're talking to to fund that flip. Um, or it, and it's not really a flip, it, you know, it's it's that initiation of open access, something that was never open before, something OA native, right? right. Um, and so I think it's based on need, um, but also models that are available, that are accessible to the existing library community that supports it. Um, and then how it might engage with 
the entire funding community, because it's not just libraries that fund scholarship, even with one product, Elsevier, for instance, it's not just the libraries that support them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing quite so well, right? Um, there's there's a huge universe that supports scholarly publishing. And so if you're able to tap into that existing community, then that's what's going to take precedence is what's easiest, what has the least amount of friction. Um, and then once libraries start adopting these criteria as what's really important to them, we may start to see a paradigm shift of how that changes, uh, you know, as far as how the money flows. Uh, but at this point, what I'm seeing is it's just whoever's brave enough to step in and actually participate in some kind of new model. Um, and, and then what also is taking precedent what the libraries are demanding. I think that we're definitely in a shift, uh, you know, from where I'm sitting at CDL, um, you know, speaking of Elsevier, when UC initially canceled the Elsevier contract, conversations started happening um, naturally that we'd been struggling to have for, you know, a decade or so. <laughs> um, and, you know, journals, uh, researchers, authors started to really wake up to um, what was going on in scholarly communication and start to be curious about how they might change that for the journals that they work on. And we were being approached by titles um, interested in our library based publishing services that would never have approached us before. And so it's actually I don't have the answer to your question, Sam, but I <laughs> in this very moment, we're sort of like, oh, you know, all this stuff we've been doing supporting new open access projects for so many years. And now um, we're being approached to help support things that are transitioning. And how do we balance that? And I think that's something we're trying to figure out right now. And, and um, the model that Timothy shared um, will be a useful thing for us to look at. I would just echo what Justin and Charlotte were saying in that we, we had similar experiences at Earth Archive. and. Um, you know, when authors would come and want to want us to host a paper that was already peer reviewed and published at a journal, and we would have to go back to them and say, hey, I'm sorry, the journal that you published in doesn't support this and we're, we're not able to host this. Then those researchers, um, they, and they, they, it was very admirable to see there was a very brave discussion where these authors would go back to journals and say, what, well, why, why can't I? Do this. Why are you not supporting other uh, institutional repositories hosting of my papers? And you know, to Justin's point, a lot of conversations that probably should have been happening and weren't were now starting to happen. And it was really um, inspiring to to see that kind of shift uh, in the earth science community. The pandemic's also really highlighted the importance, I think, of preprint servers. So it's been a unique year. Yeah, th thank you both. There, um, there are a bunch of questions I want to get to, and I see time is ticking quickly. So I'm going to just kind of keep keep moving along. Um, one thing I, I want to make sure we approach is this contrast between um, funding a project overall and making it sustainable. So I wanted to address the infrastructure side of things. And one of the pieces of the criteria we have at Berkeley is the idea of um, looking at the sustainability of the project and also thinking about um, whether the infrastructure itself is open. So the sort of two pieces like the theme and the topic of the project versus, so it might be like you have a journal, but then what's what's supporting it? And it seems like that's part of what was going on with Earth Archive and um, bringing in Janeway. And I don't know if Charlotte, if that's something that you look at um, for what you're funding. But yeah, if anyone wants to talk to the infrastructure side of things, because that's sort of a the less sexy topic, but it seems like it's just as key, especially as you're trying to get into not just um, uh, journals itself, but any kind of data or code or anything else that that you want to support. Just go ahead, Tim. Well, I was going to say, um, in thinking about this, you know, and when we came up with the local criteria, and I mentioned there's sort of this low dollar and this like maybe higher investment. Um, I think for maybe some of, for some of the infrastructure things, we're looking more towards more collaboration. So it, it's not just that UC Berkeley Library is going to be able to have enough funds to fund an infrastructure project. That's where it makes complete sense to bring in the other UC schools and, of course, California Digital Library. And this is exactly what's happened um, 
with Earth Archive. So we really want to sort of socialize that when we're looking for um, standing up infrastructure, let's do it together. <laughs> Because it's not just going to be one school or it's not just going to be one library. Typically, it's going to take collaboration and sort of like uh, mutual agreement among many players that this is an important thing that we need to support. Yeah, I just, we certainly are committed to uh, using open source technologies whenever and wherever we can. And uh, we're also involved in the Next Generation Library Publishing Project, which is an Arcadia funded um, pilot to develop um, basically exactly the kind of infrastructure that would support um, all these all these different publication ventures as well as an IR. Um, it's really important, I think, for us to work in open source communities, especially as um, for-profit publishers sort of enter the space of, um, of infrastructure. Um, so uh, we're fully committed to supporting open source. Right, and Lyricist is also part of that, of the NGLP project for the very same reason. Um, but one thing that we, we also need to understand is uh, do we have issues with language. There's not a common language of what people understand as what is sustainability. Um, I, I, I know talking to scholar led groups, um, you know, where it's just faculty who are an editorial board trying to fund a journal on their own. It's a very different conversation than talking to, say, a nonprofit university press who has a, you know, many decades of, of you know, a, a legacy of infrastructure already supported, whether that's, you know, that whether they have their own, you know, open source platform that they may use, but also talking about the soft infrastructure, the people, the experts, the, you know, that's their livelihood as opposed to, you know, faculty who are paid a salary through the university, who are also just looking for a few funds to help, you know, to give to their editorial board uh, to support their work. So that's why some you see these different amounts coming in and how you define what's sustainable, you have to have a better understanding of what makes publishing work, what kind of revenue is really necessary to have high quality scholarship that serves that scholarly community community well um, and and there and like we said they're all at different scales they have different disciplinarity uh, uh, characteristics and how they serve their own communities and having a diverse array of platforms um, of publishers out there can help serve this in that idea of what is sustainable. Uh, that's where we have issues with some commercial providers. Not all of them are bad players in this space. Nonprofit and for-profit is not necessarily a good proxy to determine whether or not they you know, return those funds that you're giving to them back into the community. Um, and so we, we need to have a better understanding of what languages we're using and what does sustainability mean? Is it enough just to pay that bare amount or are they also, you know, building in contingency funds? Are they also putting in money for innovation, R&D, and to, you know, to be able to have, you know, when you look at the humanities, you know, are they putting in money for di digital humanities and all the bells and whistles that need to be added to platforms to support their work? Um, and, and so, again, we just, we need to come to a common language, I think, to solve a lot of these problems. Um, thanks, Charlotte. I want to switch gears a little bit based on what you just said and come back to something Tom said earlier I appreciated in Tom's slides your mention of the importance of diversity um, in the Earth Archive community and in terms of the board and the, the people involved in the project and thinking about all of the people involved in back to sustainability. So much of these efforts run on volunteers and how do we make sure one of the criteria we have in the, um, the project Tim discussed um, is a, a criteria related to commitment to social justice and diversity. And putting that into effect with these projects can be challenging. So I, I did, uh, um, Tom, if you wanted to talk more about how you've done that with Earth Archive and how we do that when a lot of this requires volunteer labor and is asking um, so much of people's time and how do we promote that in, in these projects? Is it reasonable as a librarian evaluating project to be funded? Is that something I can ask of the project, I guess? Sure. I think that that's a great point. And that's one thing that we are constantly trying to balance um, with within our archive, Earth Archive. And um, for us, I, you know, our, our guiding principles are that the community is paramount and um, we may be a little bit slower in getting new features out. Um, you know, volunteers may have to drop off for other commitments. And so we might not have 
uh, er expertise in certain areas. We might lose some resources as a result, but we would much prefer to delay new features and enhancements um, in favor of uh, having open access for everyone. Um, so we kind of view, you know, in the social justice realm for us, that that means that you can access research regardless of, um, you know, wh where you are. There's no requirement for, for subscriptions to, 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 to journals. Um, but yeah, not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but we want to help supplement and spread uh, research as well. Um, and so we have made every attempt to get um, research out as quickly and easily as possible and to do it to a broad and, uh, well, to, to get it out to a broad diverse community, but also to have a broad diverse community represent us as well. And so in addition to the advisory council, uh, we use a software tool called uh, Lumio, uh, which is an online um, kind of messaging exchange system. And so we have, um, you know, open access to the advisory council. Anyone in earth sciences can come and post a message and provide feedback on earth archive, provide feedback on directions they think we, we should go. Um, you know, Justin and the California Digital Library team are part of that as well. And so they can, um, inter you know, the community can interact on infrastructure as well. And, and like I said, we might be a little slow in uh, rolling features out because we're based on volunteers, but that having those volunteers and having that diversity is, is very important to us. Thank you. I don't, I don't want to cut you off and I'm just shocked by how fast this all went. Oh, yeah. um, I think we all could have talked a lot more and we've kind of barely scratched the surface, but it's been great bringing you all together. Does anyone have any closing, you know, two second <laughs> remarks they want to make? I, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, so I don't want to keep you, but if there's any, any last thing, I know we, we really did barely scratch the surface, but at least folks have an introduction to these projects. Um, and, you know, ha have a sense of how these things can come together, criteria they can look forward to, um, which can look at and consider as these projects come their way. Because often I know for sitting from the, in the librarian role, someone will contact me and I don't always know what to do with something. So I feel like I have a better sense and hopefully our participants do, of, um, you know, considerations they have, people they can contact and, and different ways of thinking about this topic. Yeah, Charlotte, I think to I think the only thing is that um, obviously we are everyone here is very passionate about what we are doing, um, and so we welcome whatever you know. However, ACRL is allowing you know is yeah. opening yeah. up conversation, but you are also welcome to contact. I think any of us directly, and we'd love to talk to you further if you have questions or want to participate. Thank you. Yeah, and to that end, I, I I'll add people's contact info to the slides, and the slides will be available. And um, yeah, any other comments? Tim, did you want to close with something? Well, I, I think it's just an exciting time, and there's a lot of different and even new open access opportunities opening. And um, yeah, as much information as we can share together, uh, I, I think that'd be great. And I'm glad we're able to do this session at ECRL to sort of get it going. So. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. You want to stop?